Welcome to In the Trenches with Dave Lapham, brought to you by First Star Logistics, our live stream right here. We have a nice little hour carved aside for all of our Bengal faithful. I, I, I Honestly, I like to hear what you guys have to say because that kind of gives me a pulse of what people are interested in as I do preparation uh, for the Super Bowl. And that's important to me, you know, because you fans aren't just fans. You guys are intelligent football fans. And I respect your thoughts and opinions on the game of football. So we're going we're gonna to go after it here for about an hour or so and, uh, and see what we unfold. We're going to start right off, Dave, with AW. And, and the thing that I think the excitement everybody had from last night at the pep rally at the stadium was I heard Uzama ripped off his knee brace right before a WWE fight. Does this mean his knee is healed and he'll play Sunday? We have four full days between now and Sunday to rest too. Yeah, well, it doesn't mean his knee is healed, but in my mind, it means he's playing Sunday. And he he basically said during the uh, press conference before the pep rally, and by the way, had the fortunate uh, experience of doing the pep rally last night. It was part of our Bengals line broadcast. We do Bengals line from six to nine every Monday night. And we did it live from Paul Brown Stadium in our radio broadcast booth. And uh, Lance McAllister and I kind of did commentary throughout the uh, the pep rally. So the first hour of our show from 6 to 7 was the pep rally. And I want to congratulate everybody. Uh, Gary Owen did a great job. Uh, Jim, Bengal super fan, Jim did a tremendous job um, as MCs. And the whole thing was like clockwork. It went off very, very well. There was great video, tremendous music. The players came out in their white sweatsuits. They looked they look clean. They looked sharp. White, white uh, tent shoes, sneakers, whatever. Um, man, and, and they, they were stunned. When they came out, the lower bowl, 30,000-plus tickets sold out in three hours. Three hours. The place was jammed. When I drove down there, I get down there plenty early, and I'm thinking, am I going to make it? I mean, the traffic was pretty pretty thick. I'm like, this is unbelievable. The police blocked off parts of ways to use, usually get to the stadium, just like game day. And, man, it was unbelievable. The energy was huge in that stadium. Uh, every player was introduced, uh, starting player. Um, Coach uh, Zach Taylor had something to say. About uh, half a dozen or more of the, of the uh, Bengals players had something to say, including C.J. Uzama. And C.J. came out, and he had a brace on his left knee when he was introduced, and he just started going in, in like a 360 as he, as he uh, jogged out on the field. I'm thinking, man, he's moving pretty darn well. And then when he gets introduced <laughs> to, to say something to the crowd, just like you say, WWE style, he reaches down, undoes the, the uh, knee brace, takes it off, throws it over his head. There was a stage uh, at midfield, and there's the big Bengal B logo in the, in, right in the middle of the football field, and the stage was between that B logo and the Bengal sideline. He rips that thing off on the stage and throws it over his head back, and it lands right in the middle of the Bengal B logo. So I think that was symbolic of, the heck with this, I'm playing. And he said in the uh, Zoom presser earlier in the day that not going to miss the biggest game of his life. Um, so he was moving around pretty well. They didn't do anything with him in practice this week, but the idea was to see what he was going to be like toward the end of, I should say, last week's practices. It, they want to see what he's like toward the end of, of this week's practices. Uh, now they're traveling out to the coast. They'll be practicing on Wednesday and Thursday, Friday, see what he's like. Uh, there, there's in my mind that, that again was symbolic of I'm going, I'm, I'm going to play. He said it in the presser during the day, that action at night, I think, uh, confirmed it. And I'm not saying that he's going to play as many snaps as he has played during the course of the season, but like we talked about earlier this week, this guy is a, is a Swiss army knife weapon. You know, he's a, he's a big, uh, blocking tight end. So if they have sub packages in there, nickel and dime packages, they can put him at the end of the line of scrimmage, put on their big boy pads and run the football at the Rams a little bit. Um, and he's physical enough to do that. If they stay base defense, he can they can detach him or keep him at the end of the line of scrimmage and use him as a mismatch against linebackers or safeties in his routes. So he he's he's a guy that is very, very versatile and allows the uh the offensive coaching staff to have some versatility. And basically, whatever they do personnel-wise, they have an answer. C.J. Uzama gives them an answer. You know, I mean, they don't get the last – the last substitution pattern doesn't really dictate what the Cincinnati Bengals might do offensively with C.J. Uzama on the football field because 
whatever they do, they have an answer to the test. You know, they have an answer to that problem. So it is big. Um, will he be 100%? Probably not. Will he be close? Hopefully so. Uh, will he wear a brace during the football game? The way he took it off and threw it last night, it might be the last time he wears the brace. Who knows? But he could. He could wear probably a smaller brace. Um, I know they'll tape it up. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll give him some, some kind of support. Plus, they, you know, medically, there's, there's things that you can do to alleviate any potential pain issues during the course of the game. So um, he's, he's a weapon. He's a weapon, particularly if, if um, you know, they start, if Ramsey takes away one of their receivers, they start doubling another receiver pretty soon. How many guys do you have that are sitting there in one-on-one -on -one scenarios? C.J. Uzama could be a guy in a one-on-one -on -one scenario that Joe Burrow gets the football to. And like Joe Burrow said, coverage dictates where he goes with the football. You know, he's not trying to force it to any individual guy. Coverage tells him where to go with the football. Yeah, and another key will be in, in, in our first question, basically, stopping Aaron Donald. Um, that C.J. Uzama plays a key, a key role in that because if you can bring him up and keep him on that edge, that allows your tackle-guard combo to work well, a little bit maybe against an Aaron Donald. I, I think doesn't he, it doesn't have to be C.J. Uh, Uzama. If you're having problems, Jackson Carmen, put him in there. You know, instead of instead of uh, their alternating series potentially at right guard, when you have a Denigy in there at right guard, if you have a, a situation and pass protection is difficult and you want to go with a six man protection, put him out there. Put Jackson Carmen at the end of the line of scrimmage as a tight end. They do it in short yardage and goal line. Do it in this particular situation. In my mind, if it takes more than five guys to block the front, because it's not just Aaron Donald. <laughs> I mean, you have Von Miller, the leading sacker in terms of active players in the National Football League. No active player has more quarterback sacks than Von Miller. Von Miller was MVP of Super Bowl 50. Von Miller has skins on the wall. So you got him. You got Aaron Donald. You got Floyd. He's got nine and a half sacks as a, a linebacker, defensive end, slash hybrid rush guy. So with all those guys, you might need more than five offensive linemen to block them. And you might say, ah, as a back chipping, is that enough? Go with six linemen. Go with six-man protection. And put your biggest bodied, able bodied guy in there to block. If you need seven, put CJ on the other side. Go seven. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. If you have to block with seven guys to be able to handle that defensive front, all I can say is Aaron Donald, when you watch him on tape, this dude is more than worthy of putting two helmets and four hands on him. Double team that bad boy. Two sets of hands, two helmets, thinking together, working together, blocking this guy. He's, he's worthy of that. He's a game wrecker, and you can't let Aaron Donald wreck the game. And, again, I, I'm watching him. Um, he, he lines up real wide. The guard, he, he lines up in a – It's a, if he goes straight up in the guard, that's called a, a two technique. He lines up in the outside shoulder, that's a three technique. He's a wide three technique. He's almost like a four eye. He's almost on the, on the offensive tackle out there. And the thing about Aaron Donald – no, he's got he's six one over two hundred eighty pounds, ran a four six eight forty at the combine. Are you kidding me? With that speed, he has got first step quickness that's unbelievable. So his game, the big strength of his game, he gets to your shoulder so fast with that first step, and then he's got this ability to make himself small and he closes around the edge. He doesn't round the edge where you can recover and, and block him. He closes like he's behind you into the quarterback before you can blink your eye. This guy is a stud. So what I would do with Jim McNally, we were always like, not just horizontal splits, two feet from the center, vertical splits. I would get off the ball as far as I could get off the ball. And, and I'll give you a little story. When we played the uh, then San Diego Chargers in the Freeze Bowl, they had a guy, Gary Big Hands Johnson, appropriately named because this guy had muckers, man, a ham with five hot dogs hanging off him. Then he would grab you, and when he grabbed you, it was over. So what Jim McNally said is, get on the ball lap. Get on the ball with this guy. Don't let him get started. You take a, you jam him. As soon as the ball snaps, you jam him. The first time I did it, he was shocked. I mean, I got up in the ball to the point where here's, here's the back of the football, and you can't line up any part of your body over the back edge of that football. I lined up right to it, stood up as vertically as I could, put my shoulders back so my face mask, everything was behind that edge of the ball. But I was literally like right up as far as I could, close as I could get to the line of scrimmage. And as soon as Blair Bush snapped the football, boom, 
I was just jamming him. I was smacking him with my hands in his chest as quickly as I could. And the first time I did it, it stunned him. I mean, it was like nobody had ever done it before. So Jim McNally, the guru of the offensive line, had a great idea. You know, he said, play with your vertical split. I said, I'm going to get as tight as I can. He goes, go ahead. Make sure you're not off signs, but get up there. <laughs> so what I'm saying is you can play with vertical splits. You're allowed to get right to the back end of the football, and you can only go as far back as if you're in your stance, your helmet has to touch the back numbers, the back edge of the numbers, the, the lower edge of the numbers of the center. That's as far back as you can get. I'd get as far back as I could, opposite of what I did with big hands. If I'm blocking Aaron Donald, I, I don't want him to get to my shoulder that fast. I want to buy as much room as I can, and then I'm going to kind of like jump him with my outside foot and outside hand. Boom! Get contact on him. Man, don't let that guy get a start. Don't let him get that quick start on you. I'm telling you, that, that this guy, is uh, he, he's the real deal. And uh, the thing about him is, he finishes, you know, I mean, he's got that ability and he, he doesn't waste it with laziness. He finishes, he finishes plays. He's a special dude. We're going to go to Dan, the man, Dave, who do you think is more likely to be affected by the pressure? Joe being inexperienced or Stafford, knowing that this could a uh, very narrow window for him and the Rams to win it all. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's pressure on Stafford because basically and really more pressure on, on Sean McVay uh, because he said he went to a Super Bowl with Jared Goff, but felt like, you know, they were good with Jared Goff, but they wanted to be great. So they moved on from Jared Goff and they traded him to Detroit for Stafford. Here's Jared Goff. <laughs> okay. Sir, he's listening to you this morning. Here's Jared. Um, so what they did was they traded him. Um, they traded Goff to Detroit for Stafford and multiple picks, number ones. So there's a lot of pressure on both McVay and Jared Goff to, uh, and uh, Matt Stafford to get it done. You know, McVay is saying, I'm pushing all my chips to the middle of the table. They don't have a first-round draft pick to like 2025. I think this year their first draft choice is like a fourth-rounder. They have leveraged their future. They have traded everything away. And, and Matt Stafford is a big part of that. I mean, he's... He, he, he sucked up a lot of those draft picks to, to make that trade. So pressure on McVay and Stafford to finish it. Now, Stafford was a turnover machine during the season. He had 17 interceptions this year, averaged one a game. He had 41 touchdown passes. That's, that's strong. That was amongst the league leaders. But his 17 interceptions was also amongst the league leaders. Plus, he fumbled the ball five times, lost two of them. He had 19 turnovers in 17 games. That's a little much, you know? You know, credit him, though, in the playoffs. He's got one interception, six touchdowns, one interception. He hasn't fumbled the ball at all. So in three playoff games, he's only had one turnover. In 17 regular season games, he had 19 turnovers. It tells me one thing. He's capable of turning the football over. You know, he, he's really being careful with it here in the playoffs. I think he's made the decision that, look, my defense is dominant. I am not going to do anything to jeopardize the football game and put my defense in a bind. Defense wins championships in the playoffs and in, in, the, in the championship game. So I think he's going to be a little bit more careful, but he has shown a propensity because he has so much confidence in his arm talent, which is as good as there is in the league. He can make every throw known to man and make it well. <laughs> and, and he has confidence that he can do it. So he'll he'll try to force it in some tight windows. I can do that. I can get that done. And and uh, people have made him pay. And that's what the Bengals are going to have to do. If he does do that, if he feels pressure, if the Bengals are playing with a lead and he feels some pressure that I have to bring my team back, and he's known for that now, his fourth quarter comebacks are legendary. He's got as many fourth quarter comebacks, victories, as anybody in the NFL. But if you get him in that situation and he puts one up and, and, it, and you get your hands on it, man, you got to capitalize. You can't let it hit the ground. You can't drop that football. You, you got to make him pay. So obviously turnovers are always huge. Turnovers are going to be massive, you know, in, uh, in, the, in the Super Bowl. They always are. That's what cost us. My Super Bowl, I played in Super Bowl 16. We turned it over. We were a turnover machine. The, the 49ers had one giveaway, four, four over here. The Bengals, we, we were just, here you go. Can't do that. 
those guys, the team that's in the Super Bowl is too good of an opponent. They can beat you on their own. You don't have to help them. You don't have to put yourself in your schedule. Which quarterback takes care of the football? Which quarterback makes big plays, but more importantly, avoids the big mistake? So Matthew Stafford, Sean McVay, they may be feeling a little bit, a little bit more pressure. Let's face it, the Bengals, Zach Taylor, Joe Burrow, playing with house money. They've been playing with house money for a while. Now, will it be bitterly disappointing if you don't win the Super Bowl? Hell yes. Yes. I mean, you want to take advantage. These opportunities may not come knocking again. Everybody's like, oh, Joe Burrow, the Bengals, they're going to five Super Bowls. Easy. Dan Marino went to the Super Bowl in his second year and played against a guy named Joe Montana who thrashed him in the Dolphins. And that's who, and he never went back. And Dan Marino's in the Hall of Fame, deservedly so. Hell of a quarterback. There's no guarantees. There's no guarantees in football. There's no guarantees in life, as the old saying goes. You have to take advantage of the opportunity that's presented. But so the Bengals, in my opinion, they have it's I think it's much easier for them to be loose, you know, not carefree, but loose, relaxed, enjoy the Super Bowl, playing with house money. I think there might be a little bit more pressure on McVay and Stafford. We'll see. We'll see. They mortgage the future to get to where they're at. Oh, I said they, you know, they don't have a, they don't have a, they have a fourth round pick is the earliest pick they have in this year's draft. They don't have a first round pick till 2025. Like I said at the beginning, when they, when, when McVay said, I'm putting all my chips in and we were good with golf, but with Stafford, we could be great. We could win a Super Bowl. And now they're in the Super Bowl. David Perry. Good morning, Dave. Do you think the Bengals might get an indoor practice facility? I always thought it was an advantage for the Bengals with all the different weather elements. Old school football. The Bengals have been trying to get an indoor facility for years. The Bengals have, have priced an indoor facility. They've had an indoor facility architecturally designed for them. There are blocks being put up for the Bengals to have an indoor facility. It's political. It's complicated. They'd like to have an indoor facility. They don't want to be the only team uh, in the northern part of the country that doesn't have an indoor facility. It's, it's, it's not an easy situation. They're kind of landlocked a little bit, and there, there are political uh, balls that have to be juggled in order to, uh, to get it executed, and, it, it, and it's not getting done. So maybe with a Super Bowl victory, that might be a little bit more leverage, you know? I mean, uh, thank God for UC. UC has the bubble. UC has been very cooperative to the Cincinnati Bengals, allowing them to utilize that uh, that facility this week. Because I will tell you, in my estimation, having the bubble to work in and giving them an opportunity to practice as efficiently and effectively as they did, they got good work in before traveling west. Our Super Bowl 16, we had the freezer bowl in the AFC championship game, nine below, 59 below wind chill. The following week, it was below zero wind chill the entire week. We had to practice in that. We did not practice well. It hurt us. I'm not saying it cost us the football game, but we did not get work done. We did not get the necessary work done the first week when we were here in Cincinnati before we went to Detroit. Now in Detroit, it was freezing up there too, but we were using the Silver Dome, just like the 49ers. 49ers were on the West Coast getting their work done, travel to the Dome. We were freezing in Cincinnati. And when you're out in that kind of weather, it practice. I'm, we're talking practice, <laughs> as Alan Ivins says. Practice. It, practice. Practicing in sub-zero weather, you're, you're not – the adrenaline's not rushing. It's not a game. It's not an AFC championship game. It's practice. We did not get done what we needed to get done. And we tried to catch up when we got to Detroit. The 49ers had, a, had a, a cleaner path in terms of practicing. So I do think that UC providing that bubble for the Bengals. And, and really, I agree with you. Paul Brown's philosophy was practice in what you play in. So if you're playing the game in Cincinnati, get out there and practice in it. But they're not. They're playing in L.A. It's supposed to be 85 degrees. Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, in, in LA at SoFi Stadium. And the SoFi Stadium has a roof, but it's open on both ends. So, I mean, when, when weather conditions, 
it's not climate controlled. It's going to be, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be warm in there. So the fact that they get to go out now and adjust to the time zone change and adjust their body to the heat. And, uh, there's no, there's no, no real humidity out there, but it, it's pretty dry, but the heat is going to be uh, a different, different experience. Your blood thickens in cold weather. That's how your body responds. Got to get it thin back out in that warm weather out there in LA practicing in it for a week. And they should be fine. The biggest difference, uh, the, the biggest issue that the Bengals are going to face the LA Rams, it's a home game. That's their stadium. They are the players are sleeping in their own beds, in their own houses, their own apartments all week long that they've that they live in. It's it's a, it's a big difference when they go to the hotel the night before the game. That's the same hotel they go to for every home game. Everything is the same. The Bengals, everything is different. They have to worry about all these logistics. They have to worry about uh, families' tickets, families' transportation, families' hotels. When they go to, out to L.A., the Rams, they can put their families up in their residences or their friends, neighbors. Man, they have no issues. That's a big deal. Now, that's all hopefully all taken care of this week. I remember that was an issue for me, you know, making sure family, friends, everybody was squared away. But you do that the week before you travel to the Super Bowl. But you're always going to have somebody that's not happy or wasn't taken care of the right way. So, the Rams have to deal with none of that. The Bengals, as an organization, has to deal with all of that. That's a factor as well. I think the Bengals, this football team, though, they're resilient. They'll overcome it, man. I, I have a good feeling about this football team. Stephen McCoy is asking, any chance Mike Daniels can dress? And as you can see on his Twitter, if you go to his Twitter feed, he is uh, – Working out in his room, he's got beds up on the wall. Yeah, I mean, he, he he's he he's trying to be ready to whatever is available to him. Yeah, I don't. I I'm not sure what list he's on now. If he's on injury reserve list, he's done. He, he and he hasn't been activated for the playoffs. He can't be activated for the Super Bowl. So I I have a feeling that there's probably uh, two chances, slim and none, that uh, that that it happens. But again, I've got a I, there could it could be slim. He could have a slim chance depending on what list they put him on from an injury standpoint. So we shall see. I'll tell you though, how about the signings that they, they, they found free agents out there that have been in the league eight years, 10 years as defensive linemen. The one thing COVID did was it expanded the practice squads. I mean, you could now have a dozen players on your practice squad and it doesn't have to be rookie or, or players with only one year experience in the NFL. You got guys that have 10 years experience, like Daniels, in the National Football League that was on practice squads. Not just the Bengals, but all over the league. And you can take people from the other team's practice squad and put them on your active roster. And that's what the Bengals have done. You know, I mean, they, they've done a great job you know, filling in when necessary and, and uh, putting bodies in, the, in those holes in the, in the defensive line room. Um, and honestly, how about in this Super Bowl, both punt returners, in this game, we're practice squad players. They're going to be activated off the practice squad for the Super Bowl. Trent Taylor, we know all about him with the Cincinnati Bengals. But how about the guy who has been a big, big uh, lightning rod for the uh, for the L.A. Rams, Brandon Powell? He came off their practice squad uh, during the, the the regular season. He averaged twenty two over twenty two yards per punt return. Had a sixty one yard touchdown. Fifth in the NFL, the Rams returning punts. In the playoffs, he's done the same thing. In the playoffs, this guy's averaging 15.8 yards on five punt returns, has a long of 33 yards. The big big deal for the Rams, kickoffs anymore, it, it, it's, it's negated. I mean, they're just blasted into the end zone and you do touchbacks. That's a high, high percentage of the kickoffs. But punts, punts dictate the hidden yards of field position. The Rams have averaged 15.8 yards per punt, and they're, they've allowed four yards per punt, plus 11.8 yards. That's over a first down that they don't have to worry about that the other team does. You multiply 11.8 yards by, say, four punts. You know, it could be four punts for each team. You're averaging almost 12 yards of field position advantage. That's half a football field of hidden yards. It's almost five first downs. The Rams don't have to worry about 
that the Bengals might have to worry about if it stays that way. Hopefully Trent Taylor averages a lot better than four yards per punt return, and hopefully the Bengals control the Rams' Powell where he doesn't average, you know, almost 16 yards per punt return. That's going to be a big, big deal in this football game. And both of these guys are practice squad guys. That's how valuable the practice squad has become to franchises in the National Football League because of COVID. They opened up the practice squad to a dozen players. You don't have to be a rookie or a first-year guy. You can be a 10-year NFL veteran and teams capitalize nobody more so than the Bengals. I just checked the latest, Dave. Mike Daniels is on the practice squad right now. Also, reserve designated to return, Auden Tate. Well, and, and is is he on uh he's not on IR. You can be on IR from the be on the practice squad and still be designated on IR. That's the thing. I don't know if he's on that list. It just that says he's on practice squad. Not. That's all it says. Okay. We'll see. A, a, a practice squad injured, Thaddeus Moss, Mason Shrek. Okay, he's off of that then. He was on that, so he is on the practice squad. Um, that's why Thaddeus Moss, when we had the question the other day, he's not going to be he's not going to be a factor in the in the Super Bowl. He's on the uh, injured. There's injured practice squad list. There's injured, uh, you know, roster regular roster list. There's so many lists now because of COVID. There's COVID nineteen list that you, when you have COVID, you're on that list. There are so many lists in the National Football League. It's crazy. We could we could see Mike Daniels then. It's a possibility. We'll see how much how well he's moving. I mean, they think if they think that uh, a Mike Daniels at seventy five percent is better than a hundred percent veteran guy they got off of a uh, off that they filled the roster in at, at defensive line down the stretch of the season, they might go that direction, but. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see. Well, and, and they don't have to make that designation until very, very late uh, this week. So as it unfolds, we will see. We shall see. Because Mike Daniels, when he got hurt, it was a shame. Mike Daniels in Cleveland was tooling the Cleveland Browns. He had he was dominant up front. I mean, and that, that wasn't the Cleveland Browns' backups. The Bengals weren't playing anybody. They weren't playing any of their starters. Cleveland Browns playing all their starters. And that offensive line is a good offensive line, one of the best, if not the best, run-blocking offensive line in the NFL. And Mike Daniels was playing with those guys. I mean, he flashed. He made a lot of big plays in that game up in Cleveland. So and the, th the thing is, you have to control. You, in my mind, a big, big factor in this football game, hold the Rams to less than 100 yards rushing. If they get a running game going, it's going to make life easier for Stafford. If Stafford is throwing the football because he has to, it's going to be much easier to control Matthew Stafford, OBJ, Cooper Cup. If they're, if he's throwing the football because he wants to, because they have a running game going, <sighs> different deal, man. So you're going to, the, the interior defensive line is going to have to play well. You earn the right to rush the passer by stopping the run and, uh, and that's stopping the run between the tackles and obviously the, Defensive ends, outside backers, set that edge, control the run game. You have a right to rush the passer, earn the right to rush the passer. I think that's huge for the Bengals. The one way to help control the pass rush of the Rams, on first and second down, win. Win on first and second down. Run the ball some on first and second down. Mix run and pass. Keep yourself out of third and long situations. Stay ahead of the chains. You fall behind the chains against the Rams, and that defensive front, whoo, Manischewitz, that's, that's tough tough sledding then. All right, I mentioned a couple of things, Dave. First off, uh, everybody, you are in the trenches with Dave Lapham, live streaming before Dave heads out this week to L.A. for the Super Bowl. Yep. Uh, we spent Saturday and Sunday several hours in here in the studio working on some stuff for the week. I want to make sure everyone stays tuned to in the trenches because we have – Sunday we had the uh, – Mark Duffner interview, which was great. Special assistant, de defensive side of the football, 25 years as a as a coach in the National Football League. His first Super Bowl, well-earned, well-deserved. Yesterday, we, re we released Bengals defensive coordinator Lou Anamruo. Right. Uh, today, at uh, 1030 this morning, we'll have a release with Brian Callahan. Mm -hmm. uh, very deep in, de in detail. Uh, gave us a lot of time. We, upcoming this week, we have Darren Simmons, 
Frank Pollock. We have uh, special guest Ken Anderson. Yep. Very special guest. Uh, we also have the father of, is it Money Mac? Is it Shooter? <laughs> you know, there's so many different. There's anything he wants to be. He wants to be as long as he keeps making those game winning field goals, no one cares. But uh, LaDon McPherson will be uh, one of our guests this week. I call, I, I'm going to call him. You don't remember the bionic man? I call him the bionic leg. I mean, it, it's not a real, it's it's a bionic leg. And his dad answers, not to give it away, I'm not going to give it away, a little tease about how far he thinks his oh, son yeah. can hit. Oh, yeah. Well, so, let's he, put it this he way. He should know. He has three kids that kick. Let's put it this way. When, when uh, McPherson was kicking at Florida, Shane Graham, who Darren Simmons coached with the Cincinnati Bengals, Shane Graham was his kicking coach at Florida. For a period of time and he sent Darren Simmons video when Evan McPherson was a sophomore hitting multiple field goals from 68 yards in practice without any problem 68 yards boom boom that just that tells you the bionic leg strength that this kid has and uh LaDon McPherson three kids that went to college Louisiana Tech Florida now the youngest to Auburn on kicking scholarships. How about that? That's that's incredible. A lucky man is LaDon McPherson. We have him. And uh, later today, um, I've confirmed we're, we're going to be talking to Phil Sims, going to get his perspective on what the Cincinnati Bengals uh, season has uh, has meant to not just here in Cincinnati, but the National Football League. And, and I'm very interested to get his take on Joe Burrow now that Joe Burrow has this season almost finalized. I mean, he is, he is one win away. And Bill Sims knows of what he speaks, a Super Bowl MVP. Bill Sims went 20 for 22 in the Super Bowl. How about in the biggest game, the biggest stage, the biggest game of your life, to have almost a perfect football game? You talk about playing big in a big game. Bill Sims played gigantically. So going to get his perspective on all of that stuff. And then on Saturday, keys to a Bengals victory in Super Bowl 56. That would be sweet. I'm telling you, like to see Mike Brown up on that podium accepting Lombardi Trophy from the commissioner, Roger Goodell. All right, let's get back to it. King of the Foothills. Hey, Dave, if the Bengals win on Sunday, do you think you'll cry tears of joy? I know I'll be weeping like a baby. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I'll be crying tears of joy, but I know I'll be ecstatic. There's no question about that. Uh, it, it's honestly. I've said this, uh, and believe me, during Super Bowl, when you when you are one of the participants in the Super Bowl, as a broadcast, you find out how many sports talk stations and podcasts and everything else there is in the country. Oh, my goodness. Lord have mercy. It is crazy out there. But it's a, it's a good crazy. Um, and on, I've been telling a lot of people here all the last week and through this week, this Bengals football team, they're, when, I, when I think of other Bengals teams in the past, I would say, yeah, this, this team's Super Bowl worthy. If things go well and they stay healthy, this team could, could make the Super Bowl. This, when, when I started this season with this football team from a broadcast standpoint, I felt like, oh, this team can make the playoffs. I mean, it, it, they could be a wild card team, maybe win the division. I did not forecast this team to necessarily be, oh, yeah, this is a Super Bowl team, like I did with a couple of other franchise teams. And so this team has exceeded and superseded expectations, mine anyway. I don't know about, about uh, everybody else's, but that's why there will always be a special place in Bengals fans' hearts for this football team, no matter what happens, no matter what happens. In my, I have more respect for this football team than just about any football team that I've, I've covered anywhere i mean at any level and <laughs> covered some good college football uh covered some good foot cincinnati Bengals football teams this football team the way they approach the game of football is done the right way every single day and man i've got nothing but respect for these guys and when you do that when you do that you are gonna if you if you have that that kind of work ethic that kind of preparation that kind of due diligence you can you can exceed expectations, and this team has. And I would love, love to see this football team cap it off with a Super Bowl championship 
in Super Bowl 56 because they deserve it. They've earned it. They have an earned confidence. And I'm, right now, they are the country's darlings, man. I mean, there are, there are more people around the country rooting for the Cincinnati Bengals than the LA Rams. I can honestly, I think, safely say that because all of these radio shows and all these things that I've been uh, part of the last couple of weeks, that's what those guys are all saying. So you know that their listeners and, and call-in people are saying it. The, the overwhelming majority of fan base when they interact with these talk show hosts around the country are talking, man, how about those Cincinnati Bengals? Big time, big time. And it, it's great for the city of Cincinnati, for the entire community, the tri-state area. And this uh, this football team is the, is the catalyst, it is the impetus for all of it. It's phenomenal. Patrick Williams says, Dave, is there a reason why the Bengals don't have Joe roll out more? Wouldn't that make him harder to bring down? It, it, it could, but it also constricts the field. He's thrown to half the football field. Joe doesn't have the arm that Stafford has. For Joe to make a throw from the, you know, between the, the numbers and, and the sideline all the way back to the left quadrants of the football field is tough. Is tough. So basically, you're eliminating a third of the football field for Joe. I think they like Joe, you know, in the middle of the football field so he can attack and dissect all of it. You know, he can diagnose, dissect, and, and, and get the ball anywhere and everywhere he wants. But you make a point. Another way to avoid pressure or alleviate pressure is roll away from it. Roll away from Aaron Donald. If you have Aaron Donald and, and Von Miller on the same side of the line of scrimmage, on the same side of the center and roll away from them. If you have Aaron Donald and Von Miller on the opposite side of the line of scrimmage, who are you going to roll into? Which way are you going to roll? I mean, they're going to be there at some point. So if if I if if I have a uh, a check with me protection in there and those guys are lined up on the same side, which they do quite a bit, and the advantage is that they can twist and stunt with all the physical abilities and talents they have, Von Miller can penetrate, Aaron Donald loop. Aaron Donald can penetrate, Von Miller loop, T-E, E-T they call it. The, the E is the end penetrator. The penetrator is the first in the in the stunt, E-T, end penetrate, tackle loop, opposite, T-E, tackle penetrate, end loop, T-T, tackle twist, tackle penetrate, the other tackle loops. I mean, and they do all that stuff, super loop. Both tackles penetrate and loops all the way around both the tackles. You can do it with the other way. Tackle and end can penetrate, tackle loop all the way around those other two. I mean, you can twist, stunt. They can be like a whirling dervish up there. And this team does all of it. And the Bengals had some problems during the playoffs picking up those twists and stunts. The offensive line has to trust their technique. So if you have a lot of that stuff going on, you can try to vacate the pocket by design instead of by improvisational abilities of Joe Burrow. But if you guess wrong and, and you, you roll into a twist or a stunt where – you know, somebody's just unblocked and he's out there, you know, uh, contain and control. It's a, it's a chess match. It's a chess match. And if they, if, if those guys are on the same side of the line of scrimmage, you can slide the protection have one extra offensive lineman, three linemen blocking two players and do that some, but boy, if, when, when the center slides that if, say, say the center slides to his left to help the left guard and left tackle, because there's Aaron Donald and there's Von Miller, the right guard and right tackle. They have to handle one-on-one. -on -one. There's no center to help anymore. If there's leakage inside, no center to help. If you know, if they run a stunt, you're on your own. You, no center to pick up anything that might uh, leak. And, and if one guy gets beaten on the twist, there's no center to help. So it puts a lot of pressure on the side of the line of scrimmage that the center slides away from. So you have to, all of that is a consideration. So there's a million things to think about. Getting the quarterback out of pocket is one way to alleviate pressure. Get the ball out of his hand quickly, less than two and a half seconds, a way to alleviate pressure. Screen game, Samaj P. Ryan, 41-yard screen for a touchdown in the championship game against Kansas City, alleviates pressure. Draws, check downs to Joe Mixon, get the ball to him out of the backfield. It's an extension out of the running game. Get the ball in the perimeter to Joe Mixon, let him run with uh, after catch. That's like a long pitch shot, a long lateral, same thing. Or if he checks down in the middle of the football field, five yards down the field, and he squares his shoulder pads up and picks up four more yards, it's second and one. 
that's a first down throw. That was Bill Walsh's West Coast offense theory. You know, if they take things away, take that four-yard pass. Worst case scenario, it's second and six. If he breaks a tackle, it might be a first down. So uh, all of those way are ways to also, you know, handle uh, handle pass rush. So there's a myriad of things the Bengals can do. And then it's a matter of, oh, boy, did I make the right call for what they're going to do defensively? That's where the quarterback, Joe Barrow, comes to the line of scrimmage. Oh, man, I'm not so sure about this. This looked – this – to me, looks like they're going to do this, so I'm going to check. I'm going to check to this. People have no idea how sophisticated and complicated this chess match is during the course of a football game, particularly when you have athletes as good as these guys. Muskegon follows, kind of follows that up. Will Burrow's, will Burrow's legs be a weapon in the Super Bowl? Mm-hmm. There's no doubt in my mind. You think about every playoff game, Joe Burrow, has not only manipulated the pocket, got out of pocket, extended plays, thrown the football, and manipulated the pocket to buy time to throw the football. How about when he finds the lane being distorted, the Red Sea parts, he runs up the gut for a first down, gets up and signals first down. That's killer. How about the one against the Kansas City Chiefs? Jones wins right away, beats the guard inside. He tries to take Joe Burrow down by, by his shoulder pads. Joe escapes, flings him away. He chases after him. He dives, misses Joe, tries to grab his ankles and, and, you know, feet and clip him to the ground. Joe gets out of that, gets to the sideline, turns it up the field, nine-yard run, first down. Killer, killer. Quarterback sack, Jones thinking. Jones is thinking, I'm going to get up celebrating. I got Joe Burrow for a sack. Ah, no, oh, missed him again. Oh, geez, first down. That stuff deflates a defensive football team. Joe Burrow, his legs and his feet are going to be a factor in the football game. I think that that's going to be more of a factor than Matt. I'm not saying Matthew Stafford is a stiff. He's not. Matthew Stafford's got some athleticism, but Joe Burrow has much more athleticism than I think people even really give him credit for. Remember, this guy was a point guard in basketball, all state, all state point guard. He's an athlete. He's got some quicks to him, short space quickness. He makes guys miss. I mean, I hear defensive players all the time. Talking about after the game, that son of a gun, man, he was slippery. Joe has got something now. He's got some quick twitch. He's not, uh, you know, he, he can run well, but in a short space, he's got some quick twitch to him. He can make you miss. There's no doubt about it. Fair Lanier is back. Do you, do the Bengals have enough cap room to re-sign both Tyler Boyd and Jesse Bates without using the franchise tag? That's going to be an interesting question. Um, you know, the, the, the the other thing about these teams, this Super Bowl team, it'll never be the same. When this Super Bowl is over, win or lose, uh, the 2022-2023 Cincinnati Bengals will have a different composition to it than this football team. But Joe Burrow is still on a rookie contract, so you got to try to get it done. You got to try to get Jesse Bates under contract. You got to try to get Tyler Borden. You got to try to take care of as much business as you can. The problem is, I'll give you an example. Remember when the Baltimore Ravens won the Super Bowl and Joe Flacco had 11 touchdown passes, no interceptions throughout the playoffs in the Super Bowl? And they paid Joe Flacco over $100 million, you know, with this contract back then. That was enormous, broke the bank. It's, you know, every year there's more and more money to be. Uh, shared out there, but that was a huge contract. What did the Ravens have to do? They had to dismantle that football team to afford Joe Flacco's contract. Salary cap was much lower than, you know, it, it, it was a much different uh, era of football, but the principle's the same. Joe Burrow, eventually, is going to be a $50 million a year quarterback. There's no doubt in my mind the way the NFL is going. The NFL, during these playoffs, had record television ratings every single weekend. Six out of every 10, three out of every five, on, on fraction reduction, three out of every five television sets that were in use on Sunday when the, when the championship games were played were watching the National Football League and the NFL championship football games. That's stunning, stunning. That's dollars. That's big bucks. The next time the networks come to the negotiating table, it's going to be huge. They're writing a big check. It's going to filter down to the players. 
the players collective bargaining with management council and the players association. It's going to go up. Salary cap's going to go up. Joe Burrow is going to be a $50 million a year plus quarterback sooner rather than later. You're going to try to get it done while he's under this rookie contract and gets a lot of pieces in place. Build the team while you can to its fullest because at some point in time, you're going to have to make some adjustments uh, to make the salary cap work. And that's, that's the Bengals are in a, in an ideal spot right now. They have a guy, one of the greatest things in the pep rally last night, the entire crowd after Joe Burrow had his little piece to say he was one of the leaders, CJ is a Joe Burrow, Joe Mixon, a lot of, a lot of players had something to say to everybody. When he was, when Joe Burrow was done, the entire 30,000 MVP, MVP chanting, Hey, he's playing at an MVP level under a rookie contract. Got to take advantage of it. Put the team together the best way you possibly can financially while you can. Dave, you're going to like this name, Disco Potato. I like it. Besides having healthy players, what do you think is the main reason for Lou's turnaround as defensive coordinator? Not only having uh, healthy players, better players. <laughs> I mean, honestly, no disrespect to the guys that were that finished the season last year. When the Baltimore Ravens came down here and rushed the ball for geez, close to 300 yards, it was ridiculous. There, there were just guys off the street. I mean, they were just trying to find bodies that they could throw out there uh, that that really were borderline NFL caliber players. I mean, they've got the the, the talent level is so improved. Uh, that in the last two years, they spent 125 million bucks on defense in free agency, and they got seven new starters. You know from teams that had experienced success. You know, let, let's go through a lot of them here. All right. DJ Reader, he came from the Texans. They've fallen on hard times when he was there. They are in the playoffs. And he, he set a record for interior defensive linemen on a contract. They trade for B.J. Hill. Billy Price for B.J. Hill, the, key, the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Trey Hendrickson, Saints, pick him up. Um, Mike Hilton, Pittsburgh Steelers, pick him up. Eli Apple, uh, Giants and Saints. Awuzie, Dallas Cowboys, Von Bell, Saints. I mean, they they improved the the personnel, the talent of the personnel. So now Lou Anarumo can do things. He's got more players with position versatility, a la Sam Hubbard. So now Lou Anarumo can open up his expansive playbook. Von Bell calls him the mad scientist. You know, you know, you can envision Lou Anarumo in the defensive lab with some uh, beakers. You know, putting together this big formula, this big concoction. That's what he's doing. He's putting together a game plan. What he did, what he did to the Kansas City Chiefs, the adjustment that was made at halftime was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Rush three, drop eight. Rush four with Sam Hubbard as the fourth rusher, but he's spying Mahomes. And when and when he realizes it's time to pressure him, boy, downhill he comes and plastering in the secondary by doing it different ways. Mahomes pre-snap read is one thing. Post-snap, he's like, oh, I'm not too sure about that. Holding the football. Nowhere to go with the football. Held him to 50 yards pass in the second half. He'll had zero. Catches zero yards. What? Kidding me? Three points? In the second half of the regular season game against the Chiefs and the playoff game against the Chiefs, they scored six total points, two field goals on 10 possessions. That explosive offense? Lou Anarumo has more talent to work with. He has player versatility that he can work with. Mike Hilton can blitz off the slot corner, can cover well off the slot corner. Pick six will show that. Well, that's the other thing about Matthew Stafford while I, uh, we talk about picks. 17 interceptions on the season. Four of them were returned for touchdown. Four pick sixes. Oh, man. The, cheap, the uh, I should say the uh, Rams, they gave up four interceptions and a fumble recovery for a touchdown. They gave up five return touchdowns. How about the Bengals having an unscripted, unconventional score in the Super Bowl? A defensive touchdown would be huge, would be massive. And Lou Anarumo could scheme it up. Um, so when you have more talent and that talent is is more versatile, uh, you can do a lot more things. And, and the other thing is you have to respect the intelligence of this defensive football team. Because Lou Anarumo can put in a million things. But if 
10 of the 11 guys understand it and one doesn't, you got to dumb it down. If nine of the guys understand it and two don't, you got to dumb it down. All 11 guys, actually, he probably plays about 17 guys with sub packages. They all get it. They all get it. That was one of their prerequisites when they uh, signed guys in free agency and drafted guys. Football IQ, love of the game of football. These guys get it. You can do a lot of things with these guys. You're in the trenches with Dave Lapham, presented by First Star Logistics from the First Star Logistics Studios. We've got about 10 minutes left with Dave. Uh, this was answered. Patrick Kays just came in and said, hey, Lapham, I don't know if someone asked already, but is CJ going to play a few snaps? You, you kind of answered that. Yeah. It all signs point to yes. Yeah, I, I would think so. I would think uh, he said during the Zoom press conference, I'm not going to miss the biggest game of my life. And then when he at the uh, pep rally, when he took off that brace and threw it to the uh, the logo B in the middle of the football field, I think that was uh, a sign that I am now free of the brace. I am going to play in the Super Bowl. <laughs> I think that was foreshadowing of things to come. How much will he play? I think that's all going to be determined by when they get to L.A. They're traveling today, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday practice going to be big for C.J. Uzama. thing is, when you're rehabbing like he's rehabbing, like I said, there's first, second, third degree tear when you talk about spraining a ligament. A sprain is a tear. How big of a tear? First degree, you can come back quickly. Second degree, it takes maybe a week. Third degree, a couple weeks. Tear, he ain't playing. His must be somewhere between first and second degree. I'm thinking in that range. Hopefully just like first degree. Now he can. Everybody heals differently. Everybody recovers differently. But his rehab has gone extremely well. The key is going to be when he practices for the first time and does football things on that knee for the first time. There's there's a lot different uh, dynamic, rehabbing, doing cardiovascular stuff, and then doing football stuff. Football stuff is CJ Zama running down the football field, putting all his weight on that knee when he puts his foot in the ground and cuts and sinks his hips and gets in and out of a cut, that is a true test. Pushing on a 300-pound lineman in a running game, that's a test. That's different than anything you do in rehab or conditioning. So you have to find out how you can do those functional things. And then when he goes to bed that night and wakes up the next morning after the first real workout of football stuff, what's he feel like? How stiff is that knee? If there's no stiffness, that's great. He wakes up and kind of limping around. So all of those things, he has to check all those boxes. All those things have to fall in line. But all indications are, and initially, they thought it was a lot worse. I mean, he went off the field on a cart. You know, they were that concerned. Uh, but right away at, after the game, they said, you know, it's not as bad as initially thought once the MRI was taken and everything was was good to go in, in that regard. Now the process has started for, for the comeback, the rehabilitation and the comeback. And like I said, he is such a weapon because no matter what they do defensively with CJ on the field, they have an answer. They go base defense, they get linebackers out there. He's a weapon one-on-one -on -one in any route against a linebacker. He's going to win. Safeties, he'll win as well. If they've got multiple defensive backs in there, nickel-dime packages, sub-packages, bring him back in on the end of the line of scrimmage, put the big boy pads on, let him block those guys and run the ball down their throat. So. They are punching, and the defense is counter-punching when you have C.J. Uzama, the Swiss Army knife, out there on the football field. Matt Osterholt, how will the Bengals' secondary choose to cover the weapons on the Rams? Do you think they'll play more zone or man? If they play man, who do you think will get the assignment to cover cup? Okay, well, what I would do is um, I'd mix it up. I'd play both. You don't want to do one thing the whole time anyway the key is in the national football league you have to change it up you have to disguise what you're changing up if you let any quarterback in the national football league get a pre-snap diagnosis and then a post-snap confirmation on what you're doing you're toast it's a matter of how dark you are, are you burnt toast or you're just you know well toasted toast <laughs> you, you got to change it up and the beautiful thing about what Lou Anarumo did you know rushing three and dropping eight he played matchup zone. You hear about that in basketball. It looks like a zone, but when somebody comes in your area, you plaster them. 
and you play man principles. That's what they were doing in the secondary. They were playing a matchup zone type thing. That's why Patrick Mahomes was confused. It looked like zone, and then guys would run with his receiver and pass it off after running for a good distance with it looked like, oh, geez, now it looks like man. Oh, man, it is zone. You don't have that much time to make a diagnosis. So he would say, all right, well, that's this is zone over here. Oh, wait, it's man. They're running with him. I'll go over here. Oh, wait, this is this this doesn't look like either definite man or zone either. That's why he was holding the football. They were playing a matchup zone concept. I think a lot of that type of thing will work, could work against Cooper Cup. The thing about Cooper Cup, I mean, you add up his regular season and postseason catches, over 170 catches, over 2,300 yards, like almost 20 touchdowns. It's stupid stuff. And the thing about him, the biggest thing you have to worry about him is every time he catches the football, he tries to score a touchdown. It's like Kelsey, Andrews, from the Baltimore Ravens, all these great tight ends. When they catch the football, they don't want to just catch a ball and get yards after catch. They want to run it in the end zone. They want to bury you. That's what Cooper Cup doesn't run out of bounds. When Cooper Cup's on the sideline, he's trying to get stay in bounds and gain more yards. Cooper Cup is a stud. You're going to have to tackle him, gang tackle him. A lot of people are going to have to run to the football. It's not going to be an easy task to uh, to shut down Cooper Cup. They'll double him some. You leave OBJ in man coverage, though, you got an issue. So they won't just double Cooper Cup and say, OBJ, you're a man the whole game, just like with the Bengals. I mean, Ramsey is going to be on on uh, Jamar Chase some, and he'll probably chase Chase some as Chase moves around. But Jalen Ramsey, when you watch tape, he lines up at right corner, left corner, inside, inside in the slot right, slot left. He lines up everywhere. They feel like he can, whoever he takes, he's erasing. That's the eraser. So he'll he'll erase Higgins. He'll try to erase Chase. He'll try to erase Tyler. He'll he'll get everybody get a little, little piece of them. Do I think he'll be on Chase more than anybody? Probably. But they'll they'll move him around. They'll play him at different spots. He'll line up against different guys. But with him, they're saying, All right, Jalen, the man you're on, we don't have to worry about anymore. Who, who are we going to double? All right, you're taking Chase, double Higgins, we'll double Boyd in the slot. That's why if CJ plays, CJ's going to get man coverage. All right, well, Higgins is hurting. Let's, let's go ahead, Jalen, take Higgins, double Chase. I mean, they're, they're going to play multiple coverages and, and looks as well. But I think on a percentage basis, I think they feel like Ramsey has to match up on Chase. I, I, would, I would feel that way. How about Chris Collinsworth? coming out with a statement. Uh, NBC had a presser yesterday about coverage of the Super Bowl, and Chris Collinsworth said that Jalen, uh, that Jamar Chase is the best receiver that he's ever seen in Bengal history. Big, and he said, and he said that's a big statement. I thought, wow, yes, that is a big statement. Isaac Curtis, and, and Chris Collinsworth has nothing but respect for Isaac Curtis. Isaac Curtis, world-class speed. Isaac didn't have the strength and the power um, you know, that the, the Chase has. And Chase, close to the speed of Isaac. The thing is, you, you get to a point where, okay, there's five boxes. Chase checks them all. Others might check four. Ten boxes, Chase checks them all. Others might just check nine. So it's it's not like, uh, you know, a big separation. But for Chris Collinsworth, who knows what he's talking about at the wide receiver position, a great one himself, to say, the things I've seen Jamar Chase do this year, I can't believe it. He's the best receiver the Bengals have ever had, in my mind, is a big, big statement. Royal Flush Terry, I think, is coming after your job, Dave. <laughs> keys to the game that no one is talking about. They haven't listened to you yet because we yep. haven't done keys yet. Is the Bengals avoiding penalties? I'm hoping there isn't a holding call trying to contain the D-line on a 70-yard touchdown pass. Well, um, there's ways to self-destruct. Turnover is one. Penalties is another. The Bengals finished the regular season, second fewest penalties in the National Football League, fewest penalty yards in the National Football League. They emphasize that. We've talked about it a bunch. That was been a big key for us in keys to the Bengals' victory all season long. And uh, so turnover is one way to self-destruct. Penalties is another. And 
missed assignments, mental errors, goal line stand we had in Super Bowl 16 against us on the four snaps. Three critical mental errors were made on different snaps at the point of attack. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't do that. That is self-destruction. We had turnovers. We had mental errors that were egregious, egregious. And we end up losing the football game by five points. So, you know, that's the thing. Play a clean football game. Avoid turnovers or minimize turnovers. You might not be able to avoid them totally. Minimize them. You know, you can deal with one. Three, you're talking about a real problem. Two, borderline. Avoid turnovers. No stupid penalties. No mental errors. That's what we're talking about when we talk about clean football. So it all, it all kind of like the hand in the glove, like OJ says, does the hand fit the glove? You know, that, that's what we're talking about here. All of it is, all of it is uh, you know, one plus one equals three. It's all synergistic. You to play a smart, clean football game, you have to minimize turnovers, minimize penalties, and don't have any dumb mental errors, period. You know, penalties can come by because you're unsure. You can't have that. You have to be sure of the of the snap count. You have to be sure of your assignment. And then other penalties can come like you're talking about, holding penalties. Because your technique sloppy. Trust your technique. Keep your hands inside the framework of the bottle body. Don't be out there grabbing. Trust your technique. That's one thing that Jackson Carmen needs to do a little bit more. One play, he'll be magnificent with his technique. And he and he handles it well. The next play, it's like air coming out of a balloon. The dude's everywhere. I mean, he just totally like blow mentally doesn't trust his technique, doesn't do it. This dude trusts his technique every snap. Uh, that, that's the next step for, for Carmen, for sure. David, an hour has already gone by. How about that? Time flies when you're having fun. I'll tell you, great questions. Glad you guys joined us this morning. We had a lot of ground covered. Covered a lot of stuff. I think we're all ready for the Super Bowl. I wish the game would have been last Sunday, but I'm looking forward to this Sunday's action. going to be packing the bags, heading to L.A., see if the Bengals can get her done. Get her done. One of the questions that we did not put up that was asked was, what would a Super Bowl win by the Bengals mean to you uh, and former Bengals, especially those who played on the previous two Super Bowl teams? Yeah, I mean, it, it's like restitution. Got it done. That's why I wanted it to be the 49ers. <laughs> I wanted the 49ers to beat the Rams, and I wanted the Bengals to play the 49ers for the third time and thinking the third time's the charm. Uh, you know, that's the, the selfish mindset of the former players that lost to the 49ers twice. Um, they got two Super Bowl rings that we wish we had. And I'm telling you something, Jimmy Garoppolo ain't no Joe Montana. So I would have been okay with the, <laughs> with the 49ers for the third time. Joe Montana, that dude now, he's in the Hall of Fame for a reason. Great player. And I'm telling you, Joe Burrow, Joe Montana. I think I heard this morning where Joe Burrow is the sixth Joe to play in a Super Bowl. I know that one of the Joes played in a bunch of them, and hopefully our Joe, Joe Burrow, plays in a bunch of them like Joe Montana did and, and wins a bunch of them. Um, but, yeah, I, I think all former players would be thrilled. All, all players that did play in a Super Bowl would be thrilled to see this football team, this underdog, you know, um, nobody was talking about the Cincinnati Bengals as being, you know, a premier team in the, in the 21, 22 season. And here they are in the final two and they could walk away with the Vince Lombardi trophy. Are you kidding me? That would be party central for every alum of Super Bowl experiences with the Cincinnati Bengals. No doubt about it. One last thing, Dave, yeah. is this the week we find out if Willie Anderson makes it is the third yeah. person to get into the Hall of Fame. It Join is. Anthony Munoz, Paul Brown. And they had uh, Aunt Willie Anderson was one of the players that, uh, one of the alum, alum players that was at the pep rally last night. They had the two Andersons, Kenny and Willie, side by side on the stage when they uh, addressed the crowd. And uh, I'm telling you, Anthony Munoz, the best tackle in my mind to play the game. Willie Anderson, the best right tackle. Anthony Munoz, the best left tackle. No questions asked. Willie Anderson, you asked Michael Strahan. 
Michael Strahan has gone on record. Michael Strahan has the record for most sacks in a single season. Michael Strahan knows of what he speaks. You know, he's all over the media world. Very intelligent guy. He said the toughest guy that he went against, Willie Anderson. He said Willie Anderson was almost impossible to beat. Willie Anderson, I don't think, gave up a sack to Michael Strahan. They didn't play a lot, but they did match up. And Strahan says that was the guy. Strahan has a gold jacket. Strahan's in the Hall of Fame. Willie Anderson should be in the Hall of Fame. And Big Willie, we're all rooting for you, man. It's well-deserved and would be well-earned, my man, for sure. TTID Forever was asking Joe Cap, Joe Montana, Joe Burrow, Joe Namath. Who else? Joe Theismann. Joe Theismann, yep. Shattered that leg. That was, that was awful. Joe Theismann, I've got to meet Joe Theismann a few times uh, post-football. Joe Theismann wears a big lift, like an inch and a half lift. When they put that leg back together, his one leg is about an inch and a half to two inches shorter than the other one. It's unbelievable the shoe he has to wear on that uh, on that leg, man. And, and he showed me the, uh, like when they put it together, it, it, it kind of dog legs a little bit, the bone. I mean, it's just a nasty injury, boy. That, that and Tim Crumrise injury. Joe Theismann and Tim Crumrise segmental fracture, fracturing the tibia and fibula, fibula, both bones in the leg, right above the ankle, right below the kneecap, and his leg was just flopping like a fish. Oh, my gosh. That was that was unbelievable in Super Bowl twenty three. And when you think about Super Bowl 23, Stanley Wilson, I mean, guys, that was the quietest pregame locker room probably in the history of the Super Bowl. They were stunned about Stanley Wilson's scenario. And then Tim Crumright to go down early in the game. Two tragedies like that. And the football team still took the first lead the Bengals ever had in the Super Bowl, Stanford Jennings, kickoff return touchdown. That's the first time we ever led, ever led in Super Bowl history. It doesn't happen much. Maybe the Bengals can play with the lead early in the game and finish it all the way through. One last thing about Stanley Wilson as I'm thinking about it. Bengals were 6-0. and and They lost to the New England Patriots. I'm sitting on the bus next to Stanley Wilson. Stanley Wilson's kind of depressed. And I said to him, Stanley, everything good? He looks at me, water in his eyes. He goes, because when you have a drug problem like he had, um, depression and elation, two big emotions like that cause, you know, celebration, drown your sorrows. Those are, those are big issues for people that have addiction problems. And I knew he was down about losing for the first time that year, Super Bowl 23 season. I said, everything good? He goes, water in his eyes. But it's the first thing I think about in the morning when I wake up. I think about it all day. It's the last thing I think about when I go to bed at night. I'm like, are you talking about what I think you're talking about? He goes, yeah, man. I'm talking about that stuff. I knew it was a matter of time. And what happened was he was so excited, so elated about playing in the Super Bowl the night before the Super Bowl. <sighs> lapsed. You know, had had the problem and uh, unbelievable, great guy, big smile. Everybody in the team loved Stanley Wilson, and they were just devastated by what took place and the fact that you know Sam Weiss had to announce to the team the morning of the Super Bowl that Stanley wasn't going to be able to play. That locker room was quiet pregame Super Bowl twenty three. Unbelievable. Final comment, Mister Homegrown. Dave starts the podcast this year. Bengals go to the Super Bowl. Boom. Coincidence. No. I think not. Yeah, well, how about this one? Dan Horde, who broadcasts UC football and Bengals football, the Bearcats go to the college football playoffs. And they play Alabama, you know, the number one program in college football. They lose that football game, but what a run for the Bearcats. And then the Bengals follow up with a Super Bowl appearance. You know, they, they get to the Final Four and advance to the Final Two. I guess Hall of Famer Dan Hort has motivated both programs, you know. Uh, and that's, that's what it's all about. It's crazy. What a year. What a fall for Dan the man. All right, everybody. Again, you've been with Dave Lapham in the trenches, presented by First Star Logistics from the First Star Logistics Studios. We appreciate everybody who took part today. Hopefully we got to your questions. We appreciate that. Make sure you check out the YouTube channel all during the week. We will have content each day leading up to Super Bowl 56. And Dave, final comment? Final final comment is I just hope the football team relaxes 
enjoys everything this week and goes out and plays a clean, smart, intelligent football game against the Los Angeles Rams and let the chips fall where they where they may. Do not self-destruct. I just hope they play Bengal football. Don't build a two or three touchdown deficit. <laughs> Hard to come back from. We were down 20 to nothing in our Super Bowl. Super Bowl 16. End up losing 26-21. Too big, 20 nothing at the half. Too big of a hole. Real quick. Tuck my kid in. He's old enough to realize what's going on. My son Dave. And I'm tucking him in that night after our quote, gathering our party after the Super Bowl. And of course I'm low as low can be. And he looks at me and I said, Night, Dave, man. Love you. Give him a dad. Why'd you guys stink so bad in the first half? And I was like, <laughs> I said, Dave, I can't talk about that right now. I probably won't be able to talk about that for a while, but uh, go to sleep. And I wanted to take the pillow, <laughs> but it was out of the mouths of babes, man. Even my young son, he wasn't even, what was he? Gosh, uh, he was, he was six years old. Even he could tell we stunk in the first half. <laughs> Please Bengals don't stink in the first half. Make restitution for, Super Bowl 16, us stinking in the first half. Go beat the Rams from opening kickoff to finish. He's Dave Lapham. I'm Dave Burke. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, who day? Dave Lapham here, and every day I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football. As a player, I realize self-motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team.